Who here is biased? Yeah. <laughs> and who here is biased against those people who are biased? Okay, well, probably all of us, um, we all carry our own biases. But additionally, algorithms also carry these biases. And this topic is becoming extremely important in today's world. And this is why it's so important to talk about it. And it's also why I'm so thrilled and honored and humbled to be speaking to all of you about this topic today that I feel very passionate about. So, hello. Um, I'm Eva, oh, Eva. Two years ago, I received a Master's of Science degree in Business Analytics and Management Science at the University College London in England. And during this master's program, I studied all different kinds of algorithms, their benefit to society, and also the issues that they place to society. This GIF little video of me is from my current job, which is at Sentry.io. It's an open source software company based in San Francisco. So let's get started. The main takeaways from this session today is threefold. One, how to build a predictive model. What are the steps? Two, where in this building process can bias be introduced? And three, what are the real world ramifications of this bias? So data science, machine learning, AI, these words are thrown around somewhat interchangeably. The way that I like to think about it is in charge of, in the context of autonomous cars. So when building an autonomous car, data science is what you're looking at to analyze. What are the false negatives? What are the false positives? How, how well is um, this car working? Machine learning is taking into account, OK, what, does time of day make a difference in terms of building the model? And AI is the system that actually makes the car stop at a stop sign. So in terms of how these three connect, you can't have one without the other, really. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is that prediction piece of data science and machine learning. So OK, bias, all this talk about bias. What do we really mean by bias? We do have bias in statistics. That is like a very technical definition of bias. What I'm referring to for the remainder of this conversation is prejudice or stereotype bias. So OK, now that we have the groundwork laid out, let's build our model. And we're going to walk through these three main parts of building a model, getting our data, cleaning and preparing our data, training and testing our data, improving our model, and then using all of these parts to make a prediction. So part one, gathering the data. There are many ways to gather data, many places to gather data. For the purposes of this exercise, the data that I gathered was built from a web scraper. Um, I used import.io. You can also use these other libraries, beautiful soup and scrapey or Python libraries that can be used. And the data was taken from Zillow.com. It's a website that lists properties and housing prices. And the reason why I did that is because today in this exercise, we're going to be building a model to predict housing prices based on data of housing listing from the city of Las Vegas. So our prediction variable here is price. All right, so the topic of, of bias comes into the conversation really early on. Because actually, majority of bias actually comes from the training data itself. And an example of this, a couple weeks ago, a study was published that self-driving cars are more likely to hit dark-skinned pedestrians than light-skinned pedestrians. And this happens because of a bias in the training data. So the models that this algorithms were built on were trained on more photos of light-skinned people than darker-skinned people. And that's what caused this, this bias of, of the stopping, right? 
it's, these algorithms aren't racist. It's based on the data that they're trained on. But removing race from any kind of data set doesn't just remove the problem, because if there's certain variables that are high predictors, they can become proxies. So we need to be looking at this topic of holistic data from a more complete view. OK, so now that we fully understand the risks of using biased training data, we're going to move on to the next part of building our model, which is exploring and cleaning and wrangling that data. So what I learned in my master's program is that 80% of data science is actually cleaning and preparing data. It's the least fun part, but arguably the most important part. And examples for this particular problem of housing was removing duplicates and empty columns understanding which variables are the most important, and maybe finding averages for those, maybe putting zeros for those, maybe removing some of the blanks, and standardizing the units. And the units were a huge mess between feed and every other way that you measure things, so it's really important that we're not equating two different types of data. And a quick note that we must start with way more data than we actually want to use because this cleaning process is going to eliminate a huge chunk of, of our data that we want to use. But in the cleaning process, we also need to be careful about not introducing bias because some variables we can tamper with and play with and move around, and some we can't. This became very apparent in a study that came out of the University of Washington where their whole study was messed up because of this cleaning process. Because data is collected in a certain way. And data is collected with a certain objective in mind. And if we're using that data to build a different model that's different from the way that it's collected, we might actually be misinterpreting what this data is trying to tell us. So the problem with training data is that it's biased, it's skewed, it's incomplete, it's human labeled, and it's human cleaned. All right, so you have your data, but it might not be enough. So from here, we're gonna have to supplement it with other features that might be helpful for us. One example is for this problem, we added um, Yelp data, and anyone here familiar with SQL, we just added that by zip code, and also looking at incomes in the area. So what are the incomes in the area? What is happening with Yelp businesses in that area? So Yelp data, this seems to be pretty democratic. It's not food critics leaving reviews, right? It's humans leaving reviews. It's crowdsourced restaurant reviews. So at first glance, this seemed to be pretty neutral data. But turns out, not really. There was a study that came out that showed that there's an issue with Yelp data in terms of how they talk about authenticity. And what that means is that an authenticity score, which was built of how restaurants are referred to as being authentic, was the highest in the US for Mexican food. And this was followed by Chinese food, Thai food, Japanese food, and Indian food. So people in the US were referring to these kinds of cuisines as being authentic. But where the problem comes in is that the research showed that as people talk about authenticity more online, the star ratings actually decreased independent of food quality. So how does that impact our model of interpreting housing prices. Well, if we're, if we're predicting housing prices based on average Yelp stars, and Yelp stars are determined by this authenticity score, then what's going to happen is we're going to have lower housing prices in areas with more ethnic restaurants and high housing prices with fewer ethnic restaurants. And this is the problem of using data that has an opt-in bias, where it's crowdsourced data that only certain people are deciding, should I leave a review or should I not? 
And we're not able to know, right, what is that distribution and demographic of those people who are leaving those reviews. So okay, another example of when something like this actually happened with a negative effect. Amazon Express launched a same-day delivery service. And they launched the beta of the same-day delivery service in neighborhoods with the highest percentage per capita of Amazon Prime users. And what happened, and here you can see in this diagram, the blue areas are the areas that received same-day delivery, and the gray areas are the areas that do not receive same-day delivery. And the results here, to me at least, are super shocking. So for anyone less familiar with the demographic of United States cities, the blue areas are the historic and predominantly white areas, and the gray areas are the historically black areas. And this is an example of real life people getting affected by this opt-in bias because Amazon Prime is a service that you can choose to opt into. So okay, so moving back to building our model. So we have our data, we've cleaned it, we've wrangled it, we've looked out for these certain things that we wanna be very careful for because we, we don't wanna build a bias model and now we're ready to actually train it. So okay, training our model and testing it. So I picked an 80-20 split for our training data and our testing data. That's the most standard split, so let's go with it. And I optimized for mean absolute percentage error. So a mean absolute percentage error of 29, let's say, is a prediction power of 71. And I looked at these two algorithms, random forest and XGBoost, because those are traditionally good for predicting models. And right off the bat, we see that the random forest model has a higher prediction power in terms of mean absolute percentage error than XGBoost. So, okay, cool. So far, that model is better. But now we look at the results table, and this is some um, hyperparameter tuning that I did changing a few things up, and we see that the random forest is still doing the best. But when we take one step down and we look at these variables and understand the importance of these variables, there actually isn't much complexity to this random forest model. So it has a better per percentage in terms of accuracy, but there's not much complexity taken into account. We only have like two variables really that are predicting this whole model and it's the size of the lot. And there's a lot more that determines price than just the size of the lot. Whereas when we look at the XGBoost model, there's a lot more variables that are taken into account in this model. So we need to evaluate this when determining which model we think is the best. But one thing that I noticed with the XGBoost model is that 13% of the prediction power was based on household income, so a high household income. And that variable is average household being $200,000 of income or more. So if we're thinking about this and we're thinking, okay, we're trying to predict housing prices and 13% of that price is determined by households that already have a high income, then we're valuating rich people's houses higher than lower income people's houses just because they're rich. So I would argue we don't really want that in our model. That doesn't create a fair model. And Kathy O'Neill, who is a brilliant author, she wrote a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, which focuses on this topic. I highly recommend it. She notes that algorithms replicate the status quo. And that's exactly what would be happening in this model of predicting housing prices from price, or from income. Okay, so now we are going to improve this model. Our fourth part. So these are different ways of increasing via hyperparameter tuning. I did a bit of this in the section um, before, and what I discovered is that removing outliers was the single most important part of improving our MAPE score. 
And the problem here regarding to bias is that when you take away the outliers, yes, you make the model higher prediction because the data is easier to understand. But if we're applying this not just to housing prices, but to people, removing the outliers is actually removing part of the population, if, if that's what we're analyzing. And so um, this PhD researcher from UCL, where I had the ability to study, remarks on just this, that algorithms will do more justice to the people who are easiest to understand at the expense of those who aren't. And we need to take into account error modeling also before we decide this is the model that we're gonna use. And one thing I noticed here is that it's a fairly normal distribution, but our distribution is a little bit left of center. So what that means is that our housing prices are being undervalued. And if a housing price is being undervalued, it's great for the buyer, but it's not that great for the seller. So this is just something that we're gonna have to take into account, something that we have to know. And now that we've done all of these parts, we can put our model into action to make a prediction. And so for the purposes of this exercise, we weren't actually going to deploy this prediction algorithm of housing prices. It was just a framework, right, to understand this larger thing. So this is what our prediction looks like. It looks like this, our actual versus our predicted value. How close do those fall against the line? Um, but more importantly, how does this affect the real world and this, this idea of bias? What do we do with it? So there are several areas and issues with bias in prediction algorithms that don't come through just in looking at this predictive model of housing prices. One of them is big data hubris. And what I mean by big data hubris is people looking at big data and thinking that big data can stand alone as a way to train models instead of a way that it adds to the model. So, so only training a model on big data without having your other data set that you're cleaning and investigating. And when did a problem like this happen in the real world? happened in 2013 with Google flu trends. So Google partnered with the Center for Disease Control in the United States to predict the flu epidemic for that year. And so Google told the CDC, we'll give you all the predictions that you need to determine where the flu is gonna break out, how many people will be affected, so you can accurately prepare. Well, because of the big data hubris problem, because they were only looking at big data, and weren't looking at data sets that they had worked with, they mispredicted the flu by 140%. So that is way off, and that ended up being a waste of taxpayer dollars and probably could have been avoided. Also, algorithms make the same prediction every time. They're algorithms. So Amazon had a recruiting tool that was based on AI that they used to determine who would be a can good candidate and who would be a not a good candidate. And what happened? This algorithm did not hire women. And why did this algorithm not hire women? Because historically, there are more employees at these big companies who are male. And if more than just Amazon had used this algorithm, if many of the big companies had used this algorithm, then women would have a lot harder time getting roles, and the same people would be offered the same roles time and time again. And lastly, but not leastly, most algorithms are secret. So when an algorithm makes a prediction, like hire this person, not that person, we don't really know what is being taken into account to make that decision. And maybe if we're the data scientist who built the model, we can understand, but even then, we don't really know. So this came into being um, in New York City 
in the Bronx district, district, 250 teachers were fired because an algorithm decided that they were bad. And these were teachers who were loved by their students and actually had pretty high qualitative ratings. But this algorithm decided that they were bad. And then when this was questioned, people were like, hey, I have really good ratings. Why was I fired? There wasn't really an answer. And this can manifest itself in lots of different ways. We have now in the US certain algorithms that are telling people what their salary should be. Well, ask, why, why does the algorithm think that my salary should be that, right? That actually happened to me. Um, so the problem with algorithms is that it's human bias treated as science and opinions embedded in math. So everyone here is biased. We're humans. That's part of being a human, right? We carry our experiences with us. And we carry those experiences into the building process, which is then treated as fact, as science, as math, and not questioned. And like we've seen in many of the examples, algorithms also generally disadvantage the already disadvantaged groups. OK, so what do we do about it? Right? We can't just let this keep happening. There has to be some kind of solution. And I really believe that there is. So the first thing we can do is look at bias as not just a technical issue, right? This is a socio-economic, socio-political issue that we can look at from new lenses. And there we have awareness, checking our training data. It's a really great first step to make sure we're not perpetuating biased algorithms. There are great Python packages, and many of these three are available on GitHub. Um, this is something that you can use to check where there might be bias in your algorithm that you're writing. Creating more transparency. So this problem of secrecy. This can be alleviated if there's just a bit more transparency around how is this model made, what decisions and assumptions were made, who is going to be affected by this, and also who is most at risk. Who do we run the risk of disadvantaging if we're deploying the algorithms that we're building into the world? Also, purpose limitation. Just because it exists doesn't mean it should necessarily be used for new purposes. And I honestly wish that this purpose limitation was used in more areas, too, in our society. And lastly, but not least at all, and this is honestly what I believe to be the most important, is representation. So having diversity in the conversation, in ideas, opinions, perspectives, because I truly, truly believe that once we have more dark-skinned people building algorithms that are related to image recognition, and when we have more women building hiring algorithms and working in computer science fields, we're less likely to be leaving out these really important groups. And so when people who don't look like each other and had come from different backgrounds join the conversation, we have the power to change the conversation and to shape the conversation. And that's the message that I really want to leave on, is that all of our voices matter, and we can all be part of the solution. Thank you. <laughs>